Welcome to the Own It Powercast, the place to be when you get serious about making big changes and accelerating growth in your life and in your relationships. Finally create the life you've always wanted, living life on your own terms. Learn how to take your fear and turn it into powerful choices that will create sustained change. Now your host, Mary Baker. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Own It Powercast, the place to come to get what you need to move yourself forward. Hey, it's Mary Baker and welcome to episode 250, Navigating Toxic Terrain, Understanding the Eggshell Creators. Well, welcome back and wow, 250 episodes. I just want to say thank you, thank you to all of you for supporting the show in so many ways. We have about 12,000 downloads, lots of listeners, and the best part is when you reach out to me and tell me how the show is helping you. So the show wouldn't be here without you, and I'm so glad that you've been here to be a part of this process, because I think the conversations that we have here are so important. So I feel really honored to be able to have done 250 episodes, and there'll be many more to come. All right, so... Welcome back to this month where we're going to continue to talk about healthy boundaries and unhealthy behavior in the moment. Last week, we talked about the emotional minefields of childhood, and I want to get into more specifics about this concept this week, focusing on especially those who create the eggshells on the floor. Now, to balance this, of course, I'm going to be talking this week on the Facebook Live on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern about our part when we see the eggshells on the floor. So make sure you join us for that as well. And the link is in the show notes. Those are really great conversations and a great place to be. If you're not a part of the group yet, go in there and join. It's private, it's safe, and there's some good work happening. But first, I'm also excited about my mini e-course that I have available, and that is my Boundaries ebook. So if you haven't checked that out yet, please do. The link is in the show notes. It has lots of great info around healthy boundaries, why you might struggle to set them, and what are some things to start working on. There are worksheets and thought provokers, and there's audio component as well, if you'd rather listen to stuff. So there's both there. And then there's a three-part masterclass called Beyond Words around how did you lose your voice and how do you start getting it back. That is a video course and also has plenty of homework and worksheets and things to work on there because a lot of this work is about looking within and looking at what you struggle with and getting honest. Then, of course, there is my flagship course, and that is Find Your Voice. And that's a 12-module immersive experience with lots of things to work on, things to explore, things to work through, and tools. For your toolbox. And there's a group coaching and a one-on-one coaching component there. So that is absolutely fabulous if you want to take the work deeper and really give that gift of change to yourself. All of that information is in the show notes, and please reach out to me if you have any questions or need anything. Okay, so like I said this week on the Facebook Live, we're going to be talking more about those infamous eggshells on the floor and how when we rescue people, we contribute to that mess on the floor as well. But what about the behaviors that we're tiptoeing around in the first place? What about the reasons, the very good reasons why we have fear? Well, I think it's important to talk about that side of things. Now, this is not to lay judgment on any of these folks who display these behaviors. And as you listen to this, you might find yourself guilty of some of them too, for very good reasons. So I think it's helpful to do both as you're listening. Think about, do I have people around me who exhibit these behaviors and have I been guilty as well? Because we want to talk openly about the impacts on others when our emotional immaturity and manipulative behaviors come out when we can't cope, which is what's happening. I mean, the big picture is that these people who create the eggshells create an atmosphere where whoever's around them never knows what can happen. And then when the person does act out, it feels emotionally unsafe, even scary at times. And it's both of these that create the trauma responses and the vigilance 
and all the things we're going to talk about today. And yes, I've mentioned these things before in different ways, but I think it takes a while for some people to allow the idea to sink in that they're dealing with emotional trauma. Because I think we still put that in a very exclusive bucket. And I think just now, as a milieu, we are learning that a lot of things are traumatic. And a lot of your struggles are probably a low-level fight or flight. Okay? So first, we got to go back to where this all started. Our childhood homes serve as the primary environment where we know we learn our social and relational behaviors. And it's often going to shape our understanding of how to interact with others in the world. Our first classrooms, you hear me say all the time. Well, let's talk about how childhood experiences contribute to the development of behaviors that can really make other people feel uneasy and lead to the eggshells on the floor dynamic. I know last week we talked about minefields, but we're getting a little bit more specific here. So the first one is modeling behavior. So kids learn by observing. We talked about that last week. They observe the behavior of their parents or the caregivers. And if you grew up in a house where one or both of your parents exhibited behaviors like blaming, criticizing, manipulating others, all kinds of fun, passive-aggressive stuff, well, you might have internalized these behaviors as normal. And that's what's key. It became normalized in your brain. It also became acceptable in terms of interacting with others. And I would add in terms of what we think is okay to tolerate in others. So if you didn't grow up with that, and you happen to, I don't know, be friends with or be dating or be working alongside someone who all of a sudden acted out very immaturely or lost their shit on you, that would really be problematic. I think it would stop you in your tracks and say, oh my goodness, this is really toxic. I can't be here. But if you grew up with that, it slowly but surely became normalized for you that that was okay. So your radar got messed up. The other big, big piece is the emotional environment. What I mean by that is that's the emotional atmosphere of your home because it greatly influenced your development of interpersonal skills. So if you were exposed to frequent conflicts, emotional volatility, maybe even dismissive attitudes, like maybe there wasn't a lot of yelling and screaming, but a lot of things were blown off and not dealt with, then you could have learned to adopt similar patterns of behavior in your own relationships. So if you grew up in a family that maybe was very loving, but tolerated bad behavior from one of its members, never really set boundaries or had any kind of intervention behavior, it just kept happening, then you learned to think that, well, we can't really do much about that, or that person's just having a bad day, it's okay. So we we learn to co-sign and rescue that behavior. Now, what about communication patterns? So the way communication was modeled and encouraged in your home growing up is definitely going to shape your communication style as you grow older. For example, if open and honest communication is discouraged or met with negative consequences at the dinner table, Well, I'm sure you could have learned to withhold your thoughts and feelings, or, and this is more likely, to resort to passive-aggressive communication tactics. And that could be getting upset about something else, disconnected or something small, and having a disproportionate emotional response around something stupid, right? Could be taking it out on a sibling because you could not confront dad about his behavior, There could be a million different ways you could have been passive aggressive. Boundary setting. So kids learn about boundaries by observing how their parents and caregivers either respect or disregard the boundaries of others and their own. So if boundaries are consistently violated or ignored in your home growing up, in the home, then kids are going to struggle to understand the importance of setting and respecting boundaries in their own relationships. So hearing no and saying no. And that is a whole thing in and of itself. And that's what can really contribute to it feeling unsafe. And it contributes to the dynamic that we're going to get into this week on the Facebook Live about why do you rescue? Why do you put up with that? 
A big part of that is there's a blurred boundary between where you end and they begin. Now, I don't think we can really focus on what we deserve until we focus on what belongs to us and what is the responsibility of others. Another big piece is emotional regulation, and that is the ability to regulate our emotions. And that was learned through interactions with our caregivers who modeled either healthy or unhealthy emotional expression and coping strategies. So if kids witness caregivers who aren't able to manage their own emotions and or, I say and or, to resort to extreme emotional reactions, they're really going to struggle with emotional regulation themselves. I mean, that makes perfect sense. But it's going to lead to volatile and or unpredictable behavior in their adult relationships, and they're going to pick people just like their caregivers to have relationships with. And then finally, attachment style. So attachment theory suggests that the quality of the attachment bond between a child and their primary people is going to heavily influence their interpersonal relationships. So kids who experience secure attachments tend to develop healthy relationship patterns. But those with insecure attachments are probably going to exhibit behaviors like clinginess, avoidance, or ambivalence in their adult relationships. So overall, the the behaviors we exhibit in adulthood are often ones that we learned early on and just internalized. And we were so shaped by the dynamics and experiences of our early home environments. There's no way we couldn't be. And it's important to recognize the influence on our relational behaviors. Because then we can figure out, okay, what happened? Why do I struggle with this? And now what can I do to change it? Well, now I want to talk more specifically about the eggshells. So growing up tiptoeing around a parent or a caregiver or an older brother or sister, or maybe even your grandma that was living with you, really had a big impact on you. And here are some ways that this may have played out for you. And for each one, there can be a continuum of horrible and not so bad and everywhere in between. So think about ones that resonate as I talk about these. Well, the first one and the most obvious one is hypervigilance. And this can be done subconsciously. You don't have to, and most people don't do this consciously. So you might have to sit with yourself for a bit and realize what your body might be doing, and you might not be aware. So hypervigilance means we're constantly monitoring the emotional state of the parent or caregiver. And as a kid, we were adjusting our behavior to avoid conflict or criticism. And what that does is makes us hypervigilant in our adult relationships, which means we can become way too attuned to the slightest signs of displeasure in others. And that leads us to walk on eggshells to prevent negative interactions. It's at the core of a lot of things that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. So hypervigilance is something really important to to think about. And it makes sense, right? Your limbic system is thinking fight, flight, freeze, or fawn because we don't feel safe. And we have to be constantly scanning for danger. And this could be You don't even notice that your stomach is clenched or your shoulders are tight or that you shallow breathe or that you don't really fully relax your body unless you're asleep or three glasses of wine or you're away, maybe on vacation or a weekend away or at a friend's house where you feel safe. Those are very important things to pay attention to. So hand in hand with this is a fear of conflict. So growing up in an environment where conflict was avoided or suppressed, or when it happened, it was awful, obviously can instill a fear of confrontation in adulthood, because we don't have really good, healthy templates of that going well. So we might avoid expressing our true thoughts and feelings, and definitely avoid asserting our needs in our relationships, because we're going to opt instead to prioritize harmony and avoid rocking the boat. And I want to again point out that you could be doing this and not even realize it until after the fact. And this, of course, goes along with people-pleasing. 
So if you were a kid tiptoeing around your parents' emotions, you could have created a pattern of people-pleasing behavior in adulthood, which means you learn to prioritize the needs and desires of others above your own. It meant sacrificing your authenticity and often your, your well-being. It's peace at any price. All of these are knitted together. So as I keep rattling these off, you'll see. Difficulty setting boundaries. Well, yeah. If boundaries weren't respected or enforced in your home growing up, you are going to struggle to set and assert them in your relationships in a healthy way, not in a rigid, controlling, push people away kind of thing. You might feel guilty or anxious about asserting your needs, and you might tolerate behavior that is disrespectful to almost harmful. Anything to avoid the confrontation because your brain is going back to earlier templates of confrontation when you were a little kid and you were scared and you didn't know and you had no one to protect you. You didn't know how to take care of yourself because you weren't supposed to have to. Your parents were supposed to be the ones keeping you safe, not making you feel unsafe. Or if your brother was making you feel unsafe, they should have taken care of that. Then low self esteem. I mean, constantly walking on eggshells and tiptoeing around a parent or older brother's emotions can really kill your self-esteem and confidence. Because you probably internalize the message that your needs and feelings aren't valid. They're not worthy of consideration. And that just leads to more feelings of inadequacy and self-doubt in your adult relationships. And then you could have had experiences outside the home, which people often do, from teachers and coaches and friends' parents and friends' siblings and kids in the neighborhood to just cement those concepts. And so all of this, of course, is going to create an avoidance of vulnerability. So when you're tiptoeing as a kid, it taught you to suppress or deny your own vulnerability and your emotional needs. I hear people say, I'm fine, I'm strong, I like it that way. But then you also are going to have a hard time seeking support from others and receiving it because you're going to fear rejection or judgment or now you're responsible for their behavior kind of thing. So that's why boundary work usually comes first in this. And then finally, pattern repetition. What I mean by that is without awareness intervention, we're going to unconsciously repeat the same relational patterns we learned in childhood. We're going to attract partners who exhibit similar behaviors to our parents or our siblings. And then we're just going to perpetuate this cycle of tiptoeing around emotions and avoiding conflict. So there you go. That's what's sad. It's the gift that keeps on giving is what I call it. Overall, when you grow up in an environment that was not safe and there were eggshells on the floor and you were tiptoeing and trying to keep yourself safe, This does impact who you are as a person and how you relate in your relationships in adulthood. So I want to get more specific because my clients talk about this all the time. So walking on eggshells, I think, can involve elements of both freeze and fawning behaviors. Because oftentimes not just one. You might be really good at one of them and less good at another, and that's fine. Because it often manifests in response to perceived threats or the need to appease. So it's all about control. Now, the person creating the eggshells is all about control, too. They need to use rage to teach you not to confront them because they're terrified and they're shame-filled. They can't be vulnerable and take responsibility for their feelings, so they act them out and they're not even paying attention to who else is in the room and what impact it might have on them kind of thing. So it's all fear-based control on both sides. Now, some people who throw eggshells on the floor are doing it in a very calculating manner. That's not most people. Most people are just doing it because their emotional age is like five or six, literally, on the inside, and they don't have better coping skills. And they have so much unresolved stuff that's just leaking out when they're upset. They don't deal with their emotions and they don't know how to express them effectively. Other people are using rage in a very tactical way to have control over you and to keep you from getting in. They're keeping themselves from being vulnerable. 
And so when we walk on eggshells, we are also being controlling. We're trying to control the outcome very carefully. So when we freeze, this is what it looks like. So walking on eggshells can be considered a form of freeze behavior because we respond to perceived threats or conflict by becoming immobilized or maybe even emotionally withdrawn. So if you felt yourself kind of shutting down or pulling within, that can be what's happening. Because when you feel like you're walking on eggshells, you might fear triggering negative reactions from other people because you think you can't handle it. And so you might respond by avoiding confrontation and suppressing your own feelings because you're trying to maintain that sense of safety and stability in the relationship. You don't want to rock the boat. So when something bothers you, you don't say anything. You don't speak up. You don't have a counter argument. You don't say, sorry, that doesn't work for me. And you certainly don't speak your boundaries. So what happens is this creates a pattern of passivity or you can call it emotional numbing or whatever you want to call it because you're prioritizing avoiding that conflict over everything else. That can go hand in hand with fawning behavior. So walking on eggshells can also involve elements of fawning behavior, and that's when we engage in people-pleasing or any other appeasement strategies that we might have because there is a perceived threat. And conflict is threat. Conflict feels unsafe. And you don't feel like you can manage conflict well either. So there's a lack of self-trust around that, like how to even do it in a healthy way, especially if nothing was ever modeled for you that was healthy. So what happens is this fawning response can involve excessive agreeableness. where We are seeking validation or approval and we're prioritizing their needs over ours. We're going to do it to mitigate conflict and maintain harmony. An example of that is, let's say you want to eat at a particular restaurant, but then your partner says, you know, I really want to go over here to this other one. And you're like, yeah, that sounds great. Instead of saying, you know, I actually wanted to eat at this one, right? <laughs> because you didn't want to create a possible conflict. So overall, we can do fawn and freeze because we're trying to navigate very complex dynamics of our relationships. And so it makes sense that you're going to do whatever you need to do in the moment to cope. These are all fear-based behaviors. And the person acting out is being emotionally immature. And they're not making it safe for you. And a lot of times you can feel like your seven-year-old self again, being afraid and not having anyone to help you or protect you or help you navigate it. Another layer is, again, the person or people who were supposed to keep you safe in the big bad world were making you feel unsafe in the home. Talk about messing with your sense of self and your sense of who to trust and how and why and where. And then when you put people in your life later on who also have some of those qualities, you play it out all over again then it kicks in your coping skills that are also fear-based and also oftentimes emotionally immature. Now, emotional maturity always hangs out with the same level of emotional maturity in others. So wherever you are on that vertical scale is who you will attract to you and hang out with because it feels familiar. And like I say all the time, someone more mature is going to probably break off the relationship or detach a little bit once they notice that you can't cope in healthier ways, like you can't ask them for what you need, like you end up being passive aggressive and withdrawn as opposed to being open and vulnerable with them, that maybe you never say no. And it feels great at first for them. (laughs) Then they realize, wait a minute, I can't trust you. So all of this is fear-based behavior and it's important to look at and it's important to change. Because this creates so much drama in relationships and it impacts people's well-being, their self-esteem, and their physical health. Toxicity is no joke. And we're really understanding how it's making people physically sick. And I don't think we really connected those dots as strongly as we do now. All right, so how do you know if you have people in your life where you practice vigilance? Let's do an exercise to see how many of these you feel are true or mostly true. Maybe you've already started to work on this, so 
some of these aren't true for you anymore and good for you if that's the case. So number one, I often feel like I have to tiptoe around certain people in my life to avoid upsetting them. I often feel like I have to tiptoe around certain people in my life to avoid upsetting them. Two, I find myself constantly second-guessing what I say or do around certain people because I don't want the conflict or the criticism. So I find myself second-guessing what I say or do around certain people because I don't want conflict or criticism. Three, I frequently feel anxious or on edge when interacting with specific people because I'm not sure how they're going to relate because I'm not sure how they're going to react to my words or actions. So I feel anxious or on edge when interacting with certain people because I don't know how they'll react. Four, I often find myself apologizing or making excuses for the behavior of certain people in my life to avoid confrontation or judgment from others. So you could be making excuses for your best friend or your boss or your partner or your sister. And five, I tend to avoid expressing my true thoughts or feelings around certain people because I'm afraid of their reaction. I tend to avoid expressing my true thoughts or feelings around certain people out of fear of their reaction. This is really important because we can look at our responses to these statements and that can give us some insight. It can help us see, do we have people in our life who exhibit those immature behaviors? Did we have parents who struggle to be more emotionally immature? And if so, that's not our fault. And we deserve to not have that in our life today at least not on a consistent basis. We have no control over who ends up being our coworker and things like that, but we do have control over whether we stay in that job, whether we stay in this relationship, whether we set boundaries with certain loved ones that we're related to. We have to look at the level of toxicity and where it comes from in our part in it, in terms of not just allowing it into our life, but continuing to allow it. That's what's key. And we will continue to allow it until we love ourselves enough not to. So today we got into some tricky dynamics of relationships that are impacted by what I call our eggshell creators. Those are the people whose behaviors consistently force other people to tiptoe around them to avoid conflict or upset. We looked at various forms of this behavior from their unpredictability, their emotional manipulation, and how these patterns can really erode trust and emotional well-being in our relationships. So there's two sides. There's our enabling and rescuing behaviors and allowing the eggshells to be on the floor, but there's also those who create the eggshells in the first place. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Not an easy topic. Hopefully you gathered some things from today's episode that resonate. And if you did, be compassionate with yourself and be honest and get the support that you need, get the coaching, get the counseling, get the community around you to really work on this because it does take community to work on this. I believe that. Hit the show notes if you want to grab any of the courses or join the group. And I hope to see you on the Facebook Live this week. And as always... Pay it forward, keep focusing on you, and I'll see you next time. We hope you took away some useful insights and tools you can begin using right away. If you did, please leave a positive review and share on your social media. Because could you imagine if everyone in your life really got it together? Remember, own it now, so you can really own it later. 